Hey, greetings, adventures, and welcome to Nerd Night News. I'm your host, Terry Mayo, and we have a very special episode tonight. Tom Quinn from Modern Myth joins us as our featured guest to talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons. Tom is the resident Dungeon Master over at Modern Myth, and they're launching a real play campaign starting June 1st on YouTube. Tom is a seasoned player and DM with years of experience in world building and running game tables, so this is going to be a real treat to be able to pick his brain a little bit. Uh, but before we jump into all that, I want to make sure that I remind you, please like this video, subscribe to Nerd Night News Channel, and ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of the upcoming shows that we have. All right, let's jump into some nerd stuff with Tom from Modern Myth. All right, everybody, welcome back to Behind the Booth. We have a very special after-school episode today of Behind the Booth, uh, presented by uh, Nerd Night News. We have Tom from Modern Myth with us today. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? We're rocking it. We're rocking Phenomenal. the glasses. Yeah, excellent. It's it's uh, it's uh, glasses. What's the day? Wednesday. Glasses Wednesday today. I guess. That's so right. uh, no, it I really is uh, now officially glasses Wednesday. That's right. That's right. We watch for that hashtag. That's going to be a big one. So, uh, no, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me. I, I uh, you guys have been uh, hugely supportive of what we're doing. So I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down. Well, I mean, speaking, from the first, go ahead, go ahead. Speaking of what you're doing, how about you uh, give the, the audience an explanation for why you have a tavern lamp? Right behind oh, you. yeah. So, well, you guys happen to be joining me in what is usually the DM in the PM studio. Uh, that's one of the uh, aspects of our kind of broader production. So DM in the PM is our video series, which really is kind of focused on um, all things behind the screen. So that has to do with storytelling, um, encounter building, really just kind of it's it's kind of a, a verbal log where I can think out loud and record it in the video. And, um, but it's rapidly branching into sitting down with some really interesting uh, guests, um, pretty much all of them also being DMs that I try to identify as, you know, I really admire something about the way they run their games or the way they think about the game, be able to kind of sit down with them and, and dig in a little bit more into that stuff. So that's kind of the DM and the PM side. Um, we're producing split screen D and D as well, which is our podcast. Um, that's Josh Winans and myself. Josh is one of the players at the table, and we're kind of attacking D and D topics, kind of looking at them from the DM perspective versus the player perspective. Though there's been a lot less clashing and locking of horns than maybe we expected in that space. We've agreed on a lot more than we disagreed on. Um, and then, and then, kind of finally, we're uh, we're just getting ready to launch the Rakish Rovers campaign, which is the continuation of our long form home game, but uh, that will launch on uh, YouTube and all major podcast platforms in uh, just under a week here as of uh, basically a week from today. So we're, we're really excited for that. That is awesome. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's well, well, you know, I guess wait, wait and see the first episode before you, uh, before you uh, congratulate me, but no, I, we're, we are really excited about it. And uh, um, we're really striving to make, everything we do um you know valuable to anyone who wants to take the time to tune in so uh we we we're we're stoked to keep bringing content yeah no that, that's in, it's important because that's an investment right it's an investment of time to sit down and watch somebody play for three four hours at a time so making it something that somebody can get something out of that's that's big uh, yeah I, I can't agree more i mean anyone who has run or played the game knows what an investment it is to be at the table in your own games let alone uh finding you know seeking out that entertainment source in other people's games yeah um and i think you know we're we're amongst really really good company we certainly did not invent this wheel um and, and some might even argue we're late to the party but uh we uh like i said i think we've got some interesting stories to tell and uh we're we're definitely excited to get people's feedback and and i hope that they are enjoying them as much as we are very cool where does the name rakish rovers come from uh, the Rakish Rovers comes from, I want to say, uh, about a level three tavern session where uh, I believe the party got a fair bit too intoxicated. And uh, the players or the characters? Both, both. Yes. I'm going with both. Um, no, I think uh, I, it, it was a deal where they had, uh, they were just departing kind of their first major 
city that they had kind of conducted themselves in. They had garnered a little bit of attention. Um, and one of the, uh, the characters, uh, an archivist named Garen Strauss, he was, he was kind of recording the events that had taken place for the, the history of the city. And he had just inquired with them, you know, like, you guys are pretty awesome. What what should I call you guys? And like I said, a, a, a fair bit of alcohol and uh, <laughs> getting towards the end of the session and, and the rakish rovers were born and it's really stuck. Honestly, the rovers is more more the nomenclature that that is used around the yeah. table. But uh, um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think they're they are kind of a, there's a bit of a ragtag nature to them. And uh, certainly I don't think they are. I like to describe them as heroes of consequence you know i don't think they were ever really characters who set out to make an impact in the world um they just are really good at being in the wrong place at the wrong time or right place <laughs> at the right you know whatever however you want to think about that um and uh so so the yeah the name i, I hope that's a reasonable enough explanation um I, I if if they they may watch this and go like no 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 this is why it's the regular rovers but <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, I was I think I was probably the most uh, in my right mind that session of anybody. So I, I'm going to tell it the way I tell it. Yeah. Sure. And if they want to correct it, they can just leave a fully annotated essay length uh, <laughs> correction in the comments. We there you go. There you go. Jump down problems. in the comments. I'm already yeah. I, I would actually I'm already going to call. I would like to hear your version in their comments. <laughs> Uh, get after it, guys. So tell, tell them how it really went down. <laughs> exactly. Anytime you, this conversation starts off with, well, there was a lot of alcohol. You know, you have to take that with like a grain of salt as far yeah. as what the yeah. story yep. is. Yep. No, absolutely. And there's, there's, you know, it, it, certainly the the name for the party wasn't the only time that uh, we found ourselves lost in that muck and mire. <laughs> so um, that's that uh, that luckily has or just by necessity has kind of been buttoned up as we've moved towards production here, because uh, that's, that's maybe not people's first choice of what they should be tuning in for. But uh, <laughs> um, I think everybody's had the uh, pizza and beer D and D nights and it was, oh, it was yeah. back, back in one of those. So. Yeah. Those are good nights. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely, oh, yeah. Definitely. So we kind of jumped into uh, a couple of things you got going on. You have the split screen uh, D and D you have the DM and the PM, and then of course your, your, your campaign. So uh, if I can, jump into your campaign a little bit so yeah absolutely. the rakish rovers uh you said that started off as like a, a home campaign you were running was it homebrew or was it based on a, a uh a so module? it's uh yeah it's a uh it's entirely homebrew in for in terms of everything that has transpired within the campaign um it is a it's a fifth edition um dungeons and dragons campaign it's taking place in the forgotten realms uh, i'm gonna heavily couch that for all you purists out there that I have done everything in my power to bastardize the Forgotten Realms uh, beyond recognition. Uh, it's, it's uh, no, I, I actually, I grew up playing in the Forgotten Realms um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just near and dear to my heart. There's, there are so many awesome pieces of content in the Dungeons and Dragons space that take place there. Um, it's kind of my go-to setting when I want to play around because I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it. And a big part of our ethos or my ethos is you got to know the rules before you break them. So I like mm -hmm. I like being somewhere where I'm comfortable before I'm really going to flex my creative writing or storytelling skills. And um, so I will say that, like I said, there's there, anyone tuning in who's a big time Forgotten Realms buff. Um, don't hold it against me. There's going to be all sorts of stuff. That you're going to go like, that's not right. Or wait, that shouldn't be there or. Um, the, the campaign, for instance, starts in a town called Orstich, which is the easternmost civilized point for all of the Forgotten Realms history buffs. They're already going, there is no Orstich in Forgotten Realms. Um, so so I've, I've added all sorts of things. Um, but there are certainly pieces of lore that uh, that I also hold sacred and kind of want to pay pay homage to. So people who, who are a fan of that setting, they'll definitely um, be able to pick up on on people, places, and things and, and go like, okay, I, I know where we're at now. I know what's going on here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as far as content, everything that, uh, everything that we run is completely homebrewed. No nothing is uh, module, um, module based, but, uh, but loosely, I'm going to use the term loosely set in the forgotten realms. Got it. Got it. All right. How long have, uh, you and your group been playing together? Uh, so the group as a whole, we've been playing together for about 15 years. Ooh. Um, and the this campaign and when i say long form so uh, this is because this is a continuation we're picking up the campaign where where an audience will be joining us at level 11 and i know there's a lot of people going 
oh, that's a bad spot to pick up any. <laughs> that's a bad spot to play Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And I promise you, we're going to be doing everything in our power to, uh, like I said, I think this kind of comes with the territory of not being married to rules as written in Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. Uh, you, you, if you're going to challenge your players, there are there are uh, power arcs and and elements to the game where you really need to go off the beaten path to keep things interesting. And uh, but joining at level eleven. And uh, people will be joining us at roughly about three and a half years that we've been playing this campaign. So when, when you know, in terms of long form, uh, you know, some people finish their whole one to 20 uh, by then. And they did start at one. And this is a full one to 20. Um, I can also promise everyone it's not another three years to the end of this thing. Uh, again, we, we dawdled a lot more than we would pre-production <laughs> uh, than we would in production. But uh, um so it, it is, it's definitely very long form. Um, and something I guess I would say with regard to being being in that long form space that we are also a, a small table. Anyone who's watched the promo has seen that uh, effectively the whole of the table is myself, uh, my wife, Amanda, um, a really, really close friend, uh, friends of ours, Josh Winans and Ariel Winans. So we are, we are two married couples. Uh, who are slogging through this both both now in the throes of having children and uh, all the other all the other things but um but we've really embraced the kind of small table ethos and some of the advantages that it brings you know having only three players at the table really allows us to tell a story that is super character driven and can be super mm -hmm. intimate at times um you know i i I love an eight man table as much as the next person, all the personalities flying around. Um, but, but it can be sometimes difficult as a player and as a DM to find opportunities to really kind of zoom in on those one-on-one -on -one scenes, yeah. those really kind of meaningful exchanges. And so that's something that we've really leaned into at really as long as we've been playing, but um, certainly the rakish rovers has been no exception to, mm -hmm. um, to that. So yeah, 15 years together, we played a full one to 20 in fourth edition. Uh, wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I'm I'm no fourth edition uh, fanboy. There, I will say great some great things in fourth edition. I, I think there, you know, a lot of people throw the baby out with the bathwater on that. There's there's plenty of good things to be taken from there. Um, but I am so thankful that we are playing fifth edition now. Um, but uh, yeah, we've we've been a number of one to twenties and uh, a number of other kind of small offshoots, one shots, and uh, little little mini adventures and things over the course of those fifteen years. Wow, wow. That, that's, I mean, that's the beauty of homebrew is that you can kind of, you don't have to throw the baby out. You can take what you like from fourth or 3.5 or three or two, whatever it, advanced. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I, and actually, I, I know this is your guys' deal, so I don't want to like throw, throw a question back, but I was just curious for, for you guys, where, where do you kind of consider home in the, in the D and D ethos is, is fifth edition a, a comfortable home for you guys, or are you more, uh, are, are you, are you guys old school guys or, you know, I just, I always try to get a sense of where, where people's roots are, um, says a lot about them as players and as, as DMs. Right. Uh, nerd, well, nerd night news as a whole is fifth edition. I think we all yeah. kind of branch out into what our favorites are. I kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I teethed on uh, third edition. That's okay. where I kind of started out and that's, you know, and kind of worked myself backwards, but always came back to third and 3.5 yeah. a little bit. Fell off in fourth edition. I, I think that's you hear that all the time, but uh, it's just. One of those <laughs> uh, but again, I've, I mean, I've what is so bad edition, about fourth edition? I'm not saying anything. I'm just. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about fourth yeah, edition. Yeah, it, in the interest of of you guys maintaining a good relationship with Wizards of the Coast, I'm gonna I'm gonna abstain from. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to actually dig, dig into that a little bit, but I I I don't I you know I don't want to I, I don't want to go down a path that you guys don't want me going down. So yeah. <laughs> No, I mean every 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 baby is beautiful. Yeah. In the eyes yeah. Well, of mother, and, and so. Again, I think I think there were there were, again there were more more good things to come out of fourth edition than people give it credit for. Yeah. I think if I wanted to play World of Warcraft, that's exactly what I would go do. And and I think that to me, that's we always kind of felt like we were playing a tabletop MMO. Um, you know, some of the some of the I guess the the cooperative beauty it's something that i loved about early editions especially i think really focused on players relying on each other to sure up their their weaknesses and i remember as we were building characters out in fourth edition i was going like 
what what do you mean there's no spell book like you're you're a wizard like what do you what like there you know i mean everything just felt like a reskinning of different damage and so again there definitely some good things skill challenges i think that gets harped on a lot but i utilize skill challenges in our game regularly because i, I think that they are challenges. yeah they're and and that's i think absolutely something you can go fourth edition got that right and i think there's all sorts of ways you can tweak those and and make those interesting to take what would be a three-hour combat and turn it into a 15 minute skill challenge and yeah. uh, keep you know in terms of interest of pace you can really um modulate what your experience is at the table by using those tools. As far as I'm concerned, the bigger your toolbox, the better. And there's no reason to discount tools provided by fourth edition, however you feel about that, that particular uh, edition. So. Yeah, totally. I have very little familiarity with anything before 5e. Like I, I knew of D and D through uh, Icewind Dale and Boulder's Gate back in the day, but yep. didn't understand the pen and paper side of things. Okay. I just, knew like oh there are these stats and they're talking about rule systems uh but i wasn't familiar with anything going on behind the were, scenes. were you uh were you a Baldur's gate player did you was that uh a... no, i was i loved ice from dale oh the, i think okay music, yeah well same same difference really dale. yeah uh, yeah 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 Fair. all of those everything that uh what was a uh, black isle was doing yeah. with the infinity mm -hmm. engine back then uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'll, I would happily spool any of those games back up and give them another run through. I probably oh, played the Baldur's Gate franchise through, <laughs> I don't know, a, a couple dozen times. It's scary how much uh, uh, how much time I have sunk into that that franchise. <laughs> but uh, but and that's that probably also lends itself to my love for the Forgotten Realms. I really just yeah, uh, they, yeah. I think they did a really good job of imparting a lot of fantastic lore in in what they did with those with those uh, those games. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of opens up a it opens up a question. Um, you hear all the time about homebrew and like the inspiration for homebrew. So, I, I mean, I gotta ask: Are you one of those DMs who kind of not not that there's anything wrong with it? Because I'm sure I, I do it myself. Um, they kind of borrow from things that they love, borrow from Lord of the Rings, borrow from Baldur's Gate, and kind of like you said, bastardize it a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, no doubt. I think I, you know, I. Quite frankly, even if you don't know you're borrowing something, you likely are. I mean, the, yeah. the idea that you're having a totally unique revelation of a, of a cool story arc, uh, I, I would say. I mean, if you are, you, you have some very lucky players because they, they might be the first people to experience that. But no, I, I, I certainly, um, I don't know how consciously, uh, you know, I, I don't know how often I'm saying, oh, I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to grab that. Uh, a, a tool that I often, uh, something we've talked about on split screen D&D. And it's something that I don't hear talked about, I think, near often enough, is how much inspiration for uh, story hooks and narrative can come from from uh, your players. Uh, mm -hmm. Like there, there have been so many times where they will be, you know, they'll be ruminating amongst themselves about what the solution is to this puzzle or what what is so and so trying to accomplish over there. And I'll go like, holy crap, that's so much better than what I was going to have them do. And, you know, and and. Uh, so, so there, there's that aspect of it. An, another, another consideration from borrowing from your players is uh, it's something that uh, I, I this is a this is a dead horse I will be kicking uh, until I'm chased off the internet outright. Uh, is uh, I'm a huge advocate for when you're starting a new campaign. If it's going to be a long form campaign and your players are investing themselves heavily into that character creation process, um, I always run. I, I wouldn't start another campaign moving forward without running through at the table and one-on-one -on -one sessions with those players, walk through their backstory. Even if it's a couple sessions that hit just the highlight points of things that happened to them prior to them meeting the other party members, mm -hmm. um, that's something that has become just a backbone of, of what I do. A good example is uh, Kel, who is the paladin played by uh, Josh in our group. Uh, as he was writing his backstory, uh, he it was essentially a, a soldier, kind of conscripted as a child into uh, into the army amidst this war that was going on. And uh, well, he's he's a power gamer and he has a massive backstory. But all I need to say is he was a a soldier amidst this this war, and that painted out a huge amount of the lore for the world that we opened the, the campaign up in. And in fact, it's still a, a pretty prevalent. The campaign opens up in the wake of a giant civil war that had just occurred in the East. And and all of that, you know, I mean, that was 
certainly heavily fueled by the fact that I was walking through his backstory and going, what are these conflicts looking like? How is this playing out? And what we started developing in that space became this really rich animosity between Horus the Red, this kind of reigning king, and Duke Grey, who had usurped him and, and kind of taken a throne of power. And there's this uneasy, um, an uneasy peace that had kind of fallen afterwards. But there's there's clearly intimations of continued violence. And, and, and all of that, like I said, really blossomed out of the fact that when he handed me his write-up, he was a soldier. He, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a laundry list of things in all of their write-ups that I immediately sat down at the world that I had been conceiving and went, how, how does this all fit? And mm. I've heard DMs go, no, 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 this is my world. You need to conform to it. I, I think that's, I, I mean, I, I, we say it all the time. Everyone needs to run their own game. They need to do, but but I personally think it's a missed opportunity to not take the really interesting ideas your players are bringing to you at the start of a campaign, and go, how can my world bend and flex to allow these events to have occurred? And and like I said, I mean, I'm, I got one brain up here. I got three other brains at my table who were all crunching on D and D stuff. I I I would just as soon put some of that to use instead of going like, no, 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 we don't have elves in my campaign. No, 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 we don't have monks in my campaign or, you know, whatever it is, what, you know, if they bring me something, um, I, I love the challenge of trying to find a way to make that interesting and interconnected with the broader world that, that, uh, you know, that I'm looking to, to, to present to them when they step into those shoes. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like we kind of are on the same path as far as like the DM style is as 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 much as anything. But um, as far as I view it as like a collabor a collaboration, it's not a me versus you type thing. Because once Absolutely. you get that way, I mean, that takes the fun out of it yeah. for me. Well, and and we'd win. We'd always win. Yeah. I mean, there's just no you know if they really push comes to shove, yeah. I think probably the DM's going to win. I just yeah. you know, no offense, players, you might be really powerful, but. Um, no, I I think it's. Uh... Oh, did I say seven orcs came out? I said, <laughs> no, thirty-seven. Orcs. Thirty-seven. You didn't hear thirty-seven, 37 orcs. And so, the yeah, island explodes. Get out of my house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, but I, I I completely agree. I mean, I think, and I think there are plenty of DMs who you know consider it to be a collaborative experience, but they really do um, covet the world space they've created and kind of expect the players to, to con conform at least initially, and they might start changing things dramatically in the world. But I love world building and starting campaigns, uh, writing right alongside what I'm getting from them about, about their, their characters and kind of, you know, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense if someone brings me a, an amazing character, I, I read a write up and just go like, this is so powerful. I can't wait to see, how this plays out at the table and and then come to realize that well there's no way that this can possibly work like we're 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 running a desert campaign and you said that you're a seafarer and you're now a, also a merfolk like a half you know it's just a weird you know whatever it ends up being that uh you know i would just as soon kind of allow the world building that i'm doing to be playing out rolling out kind of in tandem with the character building that they're doing. And that's, that's just a practice we've always employed. It's worked really well for us um, again to each their own. I know everyone has their own way of tackling that, but um, I really do think that in the interest of homebrewing and grabbing, grabbing things that are out in the ethos, it's far too infrequently mentioned that there's tons of stuff. Your players are screwing themselves over regularly by, by, you know, uh, I, I, guessing at what might be around the next corner. Um, and, and like I said, there's been, I, I can count probably this campaign, two or three specific instances where I went, what they said is so much better than what I was going to do. And I may not use it right there because I still might want that element of surprise, but it's just a really interesting interaction or interesting um, way in which the world can express itself. And, and uh, so I, I, like I said, I, I actually would say that they're one of the most potent resources I look to regularly and and th that being couched in in the starting of the campaign space obviously as they kind of become their own people and uh it's their job then to start screwing up my world and and i maybe can lean on them less and less for how how their uh how their role in the building of that world uh plays out yeah and, and how cool is it for the player to be able to 
that little kernel that they left a couple campaigns ago for it to come back and be in, yeah. and, and that's just that's that's that that's a good de-ending right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I guess that that touches on this this campaign uh, again. Our our one other long form campaign. Uh, was also set in the Forgotten Realms, and a huge amount of the lore. Um, anyone, anyone who ends up watching at some point, the the mythical heroes three. This like, I mean, ancient beyond ancient history, but these heroes who kind of delivered, quite frankly, delivered reality salvation as it was fracturing apart. Uh, Orcus was basically saying like, well, if it's not mine, it's going to be nobody's, and and he's just going to uh, undo reality itself. Uh, the the Heroes 3 was their original, very, very old, and there's so much lore littered throughout this campaign uh, that that really they built through that first campaign. Um, this this is taking place hundreds of years after that first campaign, but uh, you know there's certainly references and, and hearkening back to to moments that that a, a player now it will be meaningful to them because it's meaningful to their character. 10 years ago. Um, and so I really do like that ability to stack. I, I find that to be really useful in running one shots as well. If I want to tell a story about something that's happening in a totally different part of the world um, or provide lore, for instance, about that space, I, I love running one shots or even other campaigns. I have a smaller campaign that's taking place in the frozen North, um, but it's taking place in tandem with our larger campaign and the implications of that. In fact, that we have one more session to go. They've kind of got the final fight with the BBEG, and the win or lose in that fight is going to have major implications for the Rakish Rovers campaign because that BBEG either will be vanquished or will be ruling the frozen north uh, moving forward. So um, I really like kind of the interconnectedness, and it's it's easy as a DM. I mean, do yourself a favor. I don't have to rewrite an entirely new world and brand new characters. And you know, I mean, that it's 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 lore that should the Rakish Rovers ever find themselves in the North, I know like the back of my hand. I know every major NPC in in the respective towns, and it pays dividends uh, uh, down the road. So that's yeah. uh, you know, all of those. Like I said, I, I there there's there's almost too much to be said on the homebrew front in terms of. <laughs> Uh, where you can find inspiration and cool things that you can do to kind of give yourself a hand, even if it's a decade later. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when, well, it comes to, when it comes to world building in terms of uh, what the audience would expect uh, watching your campaign, what, what is your favorite aspect of world building when you're creating a campaign for, for um, your players? I, I think my favorite aspect of world being, I, I personally, I and mean, we're getting into the levels now, you know, let's say mid tier play where remaining super grounded is harder and harder to do. I mean, it's, yeah. um, but I really do like, I've always liked this about, uh, you know, sci-fi and, and, and fantasy writing, uh, stories that are, that you could almost strip away all the sci-fi, strip away all the fantasy and the, 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 the kernel of that story, the truth of that story is still completely relevant. If it was taking place in New York City in the 1950s, or if it's taking place in uh, Faerun in, uh, you know, 300 years after a, 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 a cataclysmic war. So I think it's really kind of, from a world building standpoint, I generally try to think grounded. Uh, I mean, we're definitely a high fantasy game. There's no, there's no question about that, but um, I really think, and, and again, getting back to kind of the the intimacy of a small table is so much of the real story is is sometimes told in a in a brief exchange around the fire between two players. Now that might be after having just barely dragged themselves out of a fight with a demilich, or you know, but but I I really think a hallmark of good storytelling is that it's it's uh, timeless from a setting perspective yeah. but you know it, it um so i will say for the for the up until now i think people who are going to start joining us may be a little deceived on this notion because we are moving into this space where um things are going to get a little more fantastical and a little more uh high fantasy and exciting but ultimately i think they can expect that the stories that both that that i love uh expressing at tables and i think um all of all of the players at our table would echo this. 
the, you know, the stories we love telling are fundamentally human stories. They're not, you know, that you, you might be playing a, a full orc barbarian uh, or a, a tiefling or, a, you know, who knows what you're playing, but, but fundamentally that story that we're communicating to each other, to, to ourselves and to a potential audience is going to be consumed by humans who have a, a human interest in, in what's transpiring. So um, yeah. that's something that I think we're, we're striving to do. And I, I, well, everyone will be able to tell me, I think that we, I think we are achieving what we're setting out to do. Um, but uh, you know, the players have all sorts of time to screw that up too. So I, you know, we could, we could see, uh, we could see, no, that's, I, I think, uh, I think it will be, uh, will be interesting, but uh, we definitely think they can expect uh plenty of glitz and glam of fantastical things, but bound together by a story that really is about three people. I think it's not an unfair term enduring the adventuring life. It, it's not a glamorous thing to, to be an adventurer sometimes. I mean, sometimes yeah. you've got your butt kicked and you're dragging the maybe corpse of your friend. Maybe there's some life still in there, you know, down a dark hallway. That's a, uh, that's a lifestyle that many people might not wish upon themselves or, or anyone else. Um, and not to paint that too bleak, but there's, it's kind of a balance between these kind of high glorious moments and the realization that these are, these are human beings. It is actually a, uh, there's gonna be some people who really eh, frown on this. Uh, it is actually a full human party. That was not by no one's design. Uh, everyone made their characters independently. Uh, they only met at session one, um, but they all just happened to be, uh, happened to be human. So um, and again, maybe that lends to some of that tone of, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, that these are, yeah, these are, yeah, exactly. And I, I think that, uh, I think that that's kind of the space I, I, like I said, I, I hope that kind of answered your question. Cause I know from a world building standpoint, there's so much to world building, mm -hmm. but I, like I said, I think at that nugget, whatever it is, I'm throwing into that world to try and spice things up and keep it exciting. It really does all kind of boil back down to, um, the fact that, that at this point, these are three characters who care very deeply for each other and, uh, and, and kind of the, the, the world that they are coming to be a bigger and bigger part of. Uh, and, and so that, uh, that's kind of the, the root of what I guess you could say the, the rakish rovers yeah. is. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. I like that. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, uh, I just got a haircut, so it's, uh, I, I yeah, appreciate yeah. that. You clean yourself up for this. <laughs> what, would, what would you say then as, or what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is starting out as a DM and looks at this idea of world building as something that is incredibly intimidating and not being sure where to start? Um, well, I think what I would actually start by saying, uh, this maybe isn't what any anyone coming to me for advice would want to hear, is run a module. That would actually be the first place. Yeah. Like I said before, know the rules before you start breaking them. And I, I don't necessarily consider homebrewing and building your own worlds breaking the rules outright. But just in terms of formatting and pacing, and there's there's a lot of things. I, I'm I'm actually I'm 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 saying this. I am I will be the first person to tell you as soon as you feel like you're you don't want to run modules, don't run modules. I, I think part of the joy of sitting in the DM chair is is kind of experiencing that learning this this world through your players as they're as they're uh exploring those spaces but i do think you might be doing yourself a disservice by just going like i i don't i don't care what those guys at wizards are doing i don't care what any i mean and there are so many i mean there are some great modules um i i honestly think that uh lost minds of fendelver is is the starting point they recommend for a reason i think it's a really successful entry point as a dm uh, or as a player but i i think as a dm that's a great place to start um i and again if if that's not your bag i i am finding out in real time every day there are so many talented creators out there who are who are creating their own uh settings to play around in who are creating there yeah. but i i would say you know walk before you run and and find something you love you know don't run something you don't want to run but find something you love that that someone who's been doing it for a long time really put some thought into so that when you get to the end of that you can go this is what i loved about that this is what i didn't like so much about that and now i'm ready to kind of craft my own thing um circumventing that i would i would say um work with your players uh, I, I think so much of world building, so much of uh, world building and running the game takes place 
away from the table. Um, I'm talking to my, I mean, we're really close friends, but, but if anyone that I'd be playing with, I'd be talking with them regularly outside of game about how they're feeling about the game, where, where their character's head's at, where their head's at. Um, and, and, and that's, I mean, you're not going to get more direct and, and concise feedback yeah. on what it is you're doing at the table that they like, that they don't like. Um, and, and, and I think that there's, a, there's a laundry list of dividends that fostering those player DM relationships versus character DM relationships um, that, that, I mean, the longevity of your table, we were just talking about on uh, split screen D and D for, you know, managing relationships at the table. I mean, it is, there's no worse feeling than having a table fall apart when people have months or years into a yeah. game. Um, and I think that, you know, as a DM, uh, like it or not, a lot of times the job of playing kind of house dad is, is in your lap. You know, you, you might be doing the scheduling. You might be, uh, you know, if, if a conflict comes up, you might be the, the, uh, the mediator for that conflict. And if you care about the longevity of your table, you're going to step up and do it. I mean, there's, yeah. if no one else is, um, you know, I certainly know, like I said, I'm, I'm not too worried about it after 15 years of playing yeah. with these guys, but if something came up that was, that was threatening a three and a half year, uh, endeavor of this campaign, I have, aside from wanting my friends to all like each other and us to all be getting along well, I have a, a vested interest in the game as well. Um, so I think, I really think I can't, I can't say enough about uh, engaging with your players outside of the scope of D&D. Um, it, it pays dividends at the tables to to build that trust where they know that you are, you're there for them to have a good time. Everyone, you know, there's a, a level of respect that you can, that you can generate in that space. So. Yeah. That's answer. <laughs> yeah. No, there is that level of um, relationship building of, of being a guidance counselor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, yeah. Some, some tables more than others, definitely. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think, and, and I, you know, there's some people I think who really grit their teeth at that notion and go, I come here to run the game. I don't, you know, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, you know, whatever it is. And again, more, more power to you. You, you do with your table, what you want to do. Um, but. Uh, I mean, it's also just being a good friend. Like, oh, well, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, aside, like just be a good person with the people that you play with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I guess piggybacking off of, off of that, uh, cause I was actually just about to talk about that, that same concept with regard to new players, say players you have not played with and, and, and new players who are coming to the game who are new to the hobby outright. Um, I, I take the responsibility of being one of the gatekeepers to this hobby, you know, yeah. I mean, any, anyone who's been playing the game for any significant period of time can either make that experience very, very enjoyable or very unenjoyable for a new yeah. player. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I don't think there really is a, um, it is unbelievable. It transcends a game in so many regards, the experiences that play out when you're, when you're at a table and everyone's yeah. in the groove that uh, to, to have the ability to bring someone in and let them fall in love with that space and not do that, not do everything in your power to, to foster that. Um, that's a huge, huge disservice. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's too cool a hobby. It's, it's um, like I said, I, I, I oftentimes don't use the term game when I'm talking with new players, because I think that kind of betrays rapidly what, what starts playing out at the table. There's something very cathartic about, uh, about, building stories and worlds with your friends. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, that's, that's definitely, you know, friend, friend or not, I think I take very seriously the responsibility of being someone who, who can, who can foster uh, future, future D and D players, future generations yeah. of D and D players. I cannot wait until my kids are old enough to play. I, that's uh. just going to, that's going <laughs> to boggle my mind the first time we get to do that. So, you know, there's, there's uh, it, it's, it's such a cool medium for um i guess really expressing yourself in whatever capacity is you want to do when you're when you're at the table so yeah and it's not that easy to get into or at least for from my experience like i was i was intentionally searching for a group to play D, &D with for about six months wow before i found before i got an invitation actually from fred uh the other co-founder of nerd news okay and then once I got the invitation and started playing with them, I then realized how lucky I was to 
be invited into my first group and have that group be as awesome. Yes. As it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if you were on the other end of that or the other side of that fence where, you know, you kind of, your, your first experience was a less than desirable one. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you know, we joke about all the time playing Dungeons and Dragons is a part-time job that you don't get paid for. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so like it, it's very easy to have a bad experience with your first one and go like, why in the hell am I going to spend, you know, 10 hours a week uh, or whatever, you know, whatever time investment it's going to be away and at the table. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, and yeah, I, I would absolutely echo that, you know, and this goes out to anyone out there, DM player alike, you know, if, if you have the, uh, the joy of fostering a new player into the space, uh, think, think how seriously, uh, it, it could have, it could have been to the detriment of your own experience. If your first experience had been one where, uh, you know, rife with ridicule or, um, yeah you know any of the kind of the the, the negative side even, even something as little as you show up for the first session and the other people there don't make an effort to talk to you or don't make an oh effort absolutely to get to know you like it doesn't even have to be negative in the sense of like making fun of you or like laughing at you or anything like that just the uh the lack of acceptance or the lack of overt friendliness as well yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's like I said, that's something that is always kind of at the forefront of my mind. I love playing with new players. I mean, it's I, I one of the very first episodes that we ever did on split screen. I was I, I was saying I've dispensed with the notion that there are people out there who won't find something to enjoy at the table because for the longest yeah. time, you know, I had my archetypal or prototypical player in mind. And I went, this is someone, you know, I had my list of friends and I could go, these are people who I think they'll probably enjoy the game. These people, not so much. And I've had, I've had people come and sit down at our table who I was like, this is the biggest waste of everyone's time. They're going to hate this. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, it's, it, and it was a failing on, it was a, it certainly was a failing on my, uh, it was, it was a failing on me. And I'm glad that I've been through this because it, it really taught me yeah. that, you know, there, these experiences are not exclusive to uh, a certain a certain temperament or a certain yeah. um, you know uh, and and so I've dispensed with that notion. It's something that I'm I'm really really happy to say that I have because now it's like I'll you know I bump into some random guy on the street and be, hey you ever played D anD D you got to get over here and, and so uh, <laughs> but you know it's just it's one of those I I love how you feel about you inviting random people. <laughs> Well, it was a little <laughs> awkward at first, but uh, no, it's, but it really is. After the 15th one moved in, she got over it. <laughs> yeah, 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 he's he's actually sleeping on the couch over here right now. He's uh, he's he's gonna get on his feet in no time. It's no big deal. Yeah. Um, Can we keep so, him? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it 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 really is the the moment I think, and there's many DMs out there I'm sure have experienced this, where you're sitting down with a new player and the game starts unfolding and other players are you know starting to do their thing. And you see that instant where they get it. Now they like they go like because it's a difficult thing to describe what a session of Dungeons and Dragons looked like to yeah. someone who's never sat at a table. And it is they, like there is such a vicarious nature of being able to watch that fall over them as a DM and go, I remember the first like I remember that. I remember that for myself. I remember that for every person I've introduced to the game, and it's uh, it really like I said it it makes for um, one a better a better community. But it's uh, and, and and it's it really challenges you as a DM to interact with a broader range. Again, I consider myself fortunate to have played with the same play group for fifteen years. Um, but so, I mean, even you know, let's take the little the little Twitter bite sized Twitter campaign where that we're running. I love. I mean, again. The, the the concepts and ideas that are that are floating around and the way people are revealing information and um and it's it's fundamentally different than the players that I'm I play with on a weekly basis and 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 I love how different but equally awesome each of those experiences can be based on the play group based on the DM um it's it's really speaks to the strength of tabletop RPGs as a whole or, or Dungeons and Dragons, I guess, if we're, if we're zoomed into to right. my scope, but. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I remember my uh, first experience at the table and, and it is crazy because it does, it does like harken back on these memories where I can smell like the black and mild cigarettes, <laughs> you know, and I can, and, and, and just being great. in this, and it was in a little 
rundown apartment building in uh, Canoga Park in, in the, the San Fernando Valley in L.A. Okay. And the, the DM was a guy named Tom and he worked on the and all these he worked on the universal backlots and he would come in and he'd be no smiles. And, he, and, and I was like, oh, I'm so intimidated by this guy. And I, I was a nurse at the time. And I remember drawing my character out on the like the days leading up to the campaign and getting the books and getting everything ready. Uh, and I, uh, he killed me in the first 30 minutes of the game, <laughs> like murder me. And there was like no coming back. It was like, no, he, well, he should, we should have gone in that room. And so um, <laughs> at the time I was like, well, screw this guy. I'm going to sit here at this table for the rest of this three and a half hours. And I'm just going to take in everything. I'm just going to yeah. learn what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't say another word <laughs> because my character was dead. But I, and, you know, I would, it was, you know, out of game. I was talking to people. And on some level after, in hindsight, I was like, well, was this guy testing me or was he really just being a, 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 a D bag? Right, uh, right. What, what, uh, do you remember what edition you guys were playing then? Three. Okay. Well, I mean, that will certainly have something to do with it. I'd be blown away if you died in the first 30 minutes in a fifth edition campaign. I mean, there's, yeah, no. there's a, a, a bit of a different animal there, but, uh, yeah. no, that, I mean, that's a, such a great story. And I, I really do think there's so many people who can, can hearken back to, you know, what that introduction was to, you know, to, well, for me to a hobby that has come to kind of dominate my life now, yeah. but, uh, it's, it, it really is, uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a special space to be in. And, and again, I mean, when, when you, when you foster that space with friends, uh, I mean, there it's, it is a, it's something that you can, uh, pro I mean, re realistically, you never have to put down. Um, yeah. there are so many hobbies out there that, you know, I mean, I, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm, I'm six and a half feet tall. So I, naturally I grew up playing basketball and there's going to come a point, no matter how much I love basketball, where I got to put it down. There's, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, I'll, I will, I'll just have to fall back into the loving arms of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, when, when that time comes. So, oh, um, oh darn. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hard life, man. It really yeah, is. Really is. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I know we're, we can't stay all night, but I did want to be able yeah, to make sure yeah, I no. asked yeah. the, uh, so this is your, really your first foray into like streaming a campaign, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, and and I do want to be clear that so the, everything we're releasing through YouTube is not being released live. We are we're we're pre-recording everything, um, with with the the fundamental reason being that there's a fair bit by way of post production we knew we wanted to be able to inject, and so you know, um, audio we we all shoot independent angles. So if there's a really important or tense moment between two characters i've got everything set up so that i can cut to a dialogue shot instead of just being the wide table shot that i can mm -hmm. and and i kind of i knew that that was something i wanted to inject from the very beginning so I'm, that, that's just a minor correction i know I, I i call it streaming all the time myself but i did want to be be clear that uh, people yeah. who will be tuning in uh they will be tuning into to a pre-recorded episode not a live episode so there won't be a, a streaming chat or anything like that yeah. No. Still, that the, yeah, appreciate yeah. the correction. What yeah, no, did no uh, what do what are you finding to be the biggest challenge? I guess if you're going to give advice to someone who's going to be getting into this, what what is the biggest challenge you found? Um, well, I, certainly there is a whole other level of time commitment. Uh, you know, I I handle all of the post production. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, Josh has a background in uh, music and audio. Um, he's he's actually a, a classically trained musician. So, and, and then coming off of that has a fair bit of experience with uh, audio mixing and things like that. So I've been very fortunate that he's kind of just, I've been like audio go and I can, you know, I can focus on the, the video side of things, but awesome. um, it, it, there is, yeah, it is, it's been, it's yeah. been fantastic. And uh, so shout out to you, brother. I really appreciate all the hard work you've been doing on the audio. It's been awesome. Hey, um, Josh. hey there you go. Hey, Josh. Um, the, I think I, you know, the, the, time commitment uh now obviously if we were streaming i wouldn't have a post-production schedule that i would have to keep um but you know generally speaking i'm spending about as much time in post-production or let's say between two-thirds and one and the same amount of time that i am at the table in post-production so mm -hmm. um you know when we sit down and run a four-hour session our our uh, our episodes uh we release in two hour segments. So we basically record four hour sessions, which is our typical session. And we split those into uh, two separate uh, episodes. Um, and so, you know, I, I've, I've certainly found that I'm spending a lot more time in front of my computer. 
than I was before. But, you know, I it's a double edged sword because, you know, if if something goes wrong while we're recording, we can fix it and get right back on track. If something goes wrong while you're streaming, you know, now you're scrambling with a live yeah. audience who might be going yeah. like, OK, what else is on? What's you know, so. Yeah. Um, and and I think, again, there's there's the advantage of there's a level of of polish and production that would be really, really difficult to emulate in a live uh, live setting um, yeah. that that is is relatively accessible in a, in a pre-recorded. But um, I really think for the most part, it's been the time, uh, you know, the time post-production, the time. And then that's balanced with prepping for the next session that I'll do post-production on. And, you know, that, yeah. that's kind of a rolling train. Um, the promotion stuff being out on social media. And um, I will say I, I am, uh, I would say a very trepidatious person when it comes to social media. Um, I'm, I'm a super extroverted person, but I just, I'm just not a social media guy. And, uh, and every uh, anticipation I had about what the social media space has been thoroughly dismantled. The Twitter community, uh, which is the primary place that I actuate for our social media stuff, uh, has been unbelievable. Uh, you guys included. I mean, that's kind of how we we hooked up. Um, and so, you know, but there's there's time involved in that. I'm, and more so if you start a little side campaign uh, via tweets, you know, there's that too. So, uh, no, I, I really think it's, you know, uh, con consider time, but I, I, I hope this is an encouraging thing to everybody is it was a front loaded endeavor. We had a lot of technical stuff to sort out. We, we shot about three months of technical episodes oh, wow. where we were tweaking audio stuff and uh, correcting, you know, we, we went through three different audio passes where first we had a, a singular condenser mic and we went, that sounds like trash. And then we switched to individual mics and we, I mean, we, we went through a bunch of different video and audio passes before we got something we were happy with. But now yeah. that that's done, um, I, I think it should be encouraging to, to a lot of people is, is if you're willing to put in the time, if it's something you love yeah. doing. And I really do like, uh, I, I, I like doing the post-production. I like doing the editing. I like, and there's, you know, we try to keep it episodes as unedited as possible. We really want what people are watching to be what's playing out at the, uh, at the table, but every now and then the DM really has to take a bathroom break. And so you <laughs> might, you might catch a hard cut. Um, but, uh, but. You know, I think now that now that things are rolling, it's it's a very manageable space. And, you know, so if there's people out there who are listening to this who are thinking, hey, I, I would really love to start sharing my stories. One, again, the more the merrier. I would love yeah. to hear what other people are doing with their at their tables. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think if you get over that hump of of getting to a place where you're happy with what it is you're producing, then it's just producing the content. And we're kind yeah. of at that place now. And and it, it definitely feels good being being in that uh, in that space so um you know definitely new challenges but nothing you know if uh if if i if if i overcame them uh anyone listening to this uh go get go start your podcast go start go your uh, go start your ap get it going so uh, Amen. it's a great endorsement right there yeah there, there you go there you go i i I aim to please. So. There you go. No, well, I, I know that I've I've treaded heavily on your guys' valuable time, so I don't I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, you know I I don't want to overstay my welcome. But uh, no, no, I was no, I, I was hoping we we're going to jump into the campaign, the Twitter campaign. We can just continue it on here live. Let's, <laughs> let's go, let's go. But I guess like, not, Tom. <laughs> so, no, that's what what's Locks doing? Hey, what's that? What's that damage roll? Give me that damage roll. <laughs> Um, no, this, this show's about you. So I, I, I do want to, uh, give you a chance to kind of one more time. You're, you're, uh, the campaign kicks off in six days, seven days. Uh, it'll kick off Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday. So a week, a week from today, um, I, it will likely go live at midnight, uh, okay. that, you know, that the, the prior night. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we're, we're basically, well, let's just call it for, for, for ease. Let's just call it. We're one week out, one week out. And where can people catch this show? Uh, people can catch it. Uh, well, they can catch all of our content. It's the best place to catch us, hands down, is on our YouTube channel. Um, it, you can just find us at uh, Mod Myth, uh, or I should say Modern Myth. Um, depend. But I'm, ha half of our accounts are Mod Myth because it was already taken, and then half, <laughs> half of them. Uh, but we did get Modern Myth uh, for YouTube, so uh, you can catch nice. us. Yeah, uh, find the channel Modern Myth. That's uh, we've got uh, split screen D and D, the video versions of all those. We also have the podcast, which is available on all the platforms. Uh, DM in the PM, which is exclusively on YouTube, 
and the Rakish Rovers in a in a week will be uh, will be um, on YouTube. It, it, we're 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 kind of fishing to see if people if there's demand on the on more on the podcast side. We 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 fully have the capability and intend to release this podcast, but we have found that split screen D and D is so thoroughly outperforming uh, on YouTube than it is in podcast form that we, we may just come to find that that's not an avenue people prefer to. And again, it's a, I, I personally, I prefer the video element when I'm watching. It's a, it's a very, uh, again, a very personal thing to be able to yeah. see someone. Um, there are many great audio only uh, actual plays that, that I listen to, but yeah. um, you know, I, I, you know, if we, if we've, put the video out there. Um, if I was giving a recommendation, that's the way I think it should be consumed. That's the way we've catered that content. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can catch us on uh, social media at uh, mod underscore myth. Um, and uh, well, I, I'd give you some other social media stuff, but uh, quite frankly, you'll, you're going to go there and you're gonna like, do these guys even exist? Did they close up shop or what? Because I, I'm, I, I like, I we we are actively bringing uh, Instagram and Facebook online. Um, but for right now, if you want to get reach out to us, uh, do it do it with the tweets because that's uh, I'm, I I try to be very very active in that space and uh, and get back to people quickly. So if anyone wants to reach out to us, and we'd love to hear from everybody, whether it's feedback on stuff they're seeing on our channel, on conversations like these, or just want to say, hey, what's up? let me join your, your bite-sized Twitter campaign. Then, uh, uh, you know, a, a, any and all of the above. That's right. That's right. And I have to say that you're very open and, and, and welcoming on Twitter. And, and I think that that's, we found a great community to kind yeah. of, uh, circle us. Cause I can say the same thing about just about everybody we've come in contact with. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it, you can't say enough good things. I think about the vast majority of, uh, of the actors in that space. Uh, I think most everybody shows up to consume awesome tabletop RPG content, produce awesome tabletop RPG content and, uh, and support each other. So, um, yeah. like I said, I, I, I was thoroughly taken aback by that space. So, um, <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. 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 It's been, it really has been, uh, it's been great. And like I said, I, I, I think you guys were one of the very, very early points of contact that, um, uh, that I had in that space. And I don't think I even uh, realized kind of how new you guys were to that space as well. Um, I think you, I mean, you, you have some seniority on, on, uh, on me, but, uh, but you know, I, I, when I, when we first started exchanging, you know, when you're, I was so lost in the woods, I was like, Oh, who are these guys? These are, wow. <laughs> someone wrote back to me. Like, you know, it's a, those first, I'll say the first four days on Twitter is a lonely place. Cause yeah. you tweet something out to your six followers and you go like, well, I guess no one's going to respond to that. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, luckily, luckily, again, people were, were very enthusiastic about uh, supporting uh, everyone. And uh, and it's a it's a very, very warm and welcoming environment now. So it's, yeah. it's been greatly appreciated. Very much. Very much. Definitely. All right, Tom. Well, this has been an amazing time. I've, I feel like I've learned a lot and I feel like you have a lot to say. So at some point, uh, Nerd Night News and, and Modern Myth are going to have to join forces as a super team and just just rock the world. But, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I can I can kind of smell a side campaign uh, in, in the works here is what I'm I'm yeah. kind of getting here. Uh, yeah. No, uh, uh, be, before we do sign off, I uh, I wanted to uh, extend a formal invite. I know that uh, you you uh, are are the man with the plan on the DM side of things over at your guys's operation, um, and uh, that's really what we do at DM and the PM. So at some point in the near future, we need to start having a talk about uh, about uh, getting you on my side of the track, so uh, oh. we can we can we can uh, talk a little more uh, DM and. Uh, and D and D stuff uh, over uh, over on our channel. If that sounds like something you're interested in, yeah, absolutely. I would love to. We can uh, see what it's like on the other side. There, there you go. It's it's uh, it's dingy, and Carl will be sleeping on the couch, likely. But uh, you know, it's it's not it's not so bad once you get to know us. So. All right, all right. Well, well. Until then, um, I cannot wait to catch you guys on Wednesday. I'm gonna I'm gonna if it's launching at midnight, yeah. I'm gonna have to stay up and uh, figure, figure. Well, out I'll, I'll probably put it up midnight uh, Tuesday, so it will be available oh, okay. all day Wednesday. All day. So yeah, we're, we're we do most of our launches midnight for the for the following day. So. Um, yeah, no, I, again, we, we'd love for anyone listening and, and certainly, uh, 
um, I would love to hear now that now that we've kind of we've exchanged a little at the table. I would love to hear uh, some of your thoughts uh, as we we open up. We will be launching with a double header, so full four hour uh, launch. I know that's a lot of content. I know, I know. It's, I, I have a hard time getting through four myself. I break it up, but uh, you know, so we'll have two episodes launching right out of the gate, and everything thereafter will be uh, will be single two hour episodes that will release. Yeah. Um, every week thereafter. So no, I, I really appreciate you guys again. Uh, just again, how uh, awesome and, and uh, welcoming you guys have been in the Twitter space and uh, taking the time to sit down with me here. Um, I certainly am looking forward to uh, all of your future guests and behind the booth. I've been, uh, I've been uh, catching those pretty religiously. So um, <laughs> looking, looking forward. Well, and I'm, I, I'm looking forward to those uh, D and D tips too. The, oh, they're the, coming. Uh, first one yeah, comes out I'm, tomorrow, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I'm dibs on that first comment slot. There you go. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, on behalf of everyone at Nerd Night News, thank you very much, Tom from Modern Myth, for coming in. And if you're still sticking around at the end of this video or you skipped all the way to the end just to hear us talk about this, then uh, do not forget to catch uh, the first episode of the Rakish Rovers on Tuesday at midnight. Tuesday at midnight. Yeah. 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 So, so if, you, if, you're, if you're a night owl, get after it. We, we want to see those. We want to see those 1 a.m. comments. Yeah, starting to roll that's in. right. I'm going to sneak off to the bathroom in the middle of the night and just start watching. <laughs> but all right, guys. All right. It has been fun. And I will see you guys uh, next time. Hey, thank Later you guys nerds. so much.